Welcome to Butterflies of Wisdom, everyone. This morning, by the time you guys hear this, it will be Tuesday, and that's when my episodes come out. Normally, they don't come out on Thursday anymore. It's too much work for me. Slash, I am, um, life is getting in the way lately, and construction zones are starting my life, and so they don't come out on Thursdays anymore, so please don't be chasing me about that. But I'm going to let Maria take it away and explain more of what she does, and we're going to have a fun natural chat. So I'm going to let Maria take it away. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name's Maria. Um, what I do for a living originally, I am a therapist. I work for um, a male prison as a therapist, but on the side, what I do is I do a, a, a woman or just an empower group. And in my empowerment group, I really advocate for change and and for people to change their life. I kind of notice a lot of people, especially now, are stuck in or feel stuck in their life or don't know the direction that they they're going, and they have that victim stance aspect to it. So, what I do in my communities, I facilitate a lot of um, empowerment groups so they can work from the inner self and they're able to release um, whatever it is that's holding them back from living their purpose or their passion in life, be it a disability, be it a trauma or just a limiting belief that they have and um, we go through that so I do a lot of different things in the community to really help empower people to step into to their alignment. I do it at work and I do it as a community service out there. That's really what I do for um, in my life. Um, it's been a journey with myself. Is healing from within. Is um, learning about um, my li- limiting beliefs or whatever has held me back, and really working from from within and. Learning, really learning to understand my thoughts or think that I internalize it as a victim stance from preventing me or keeping me stuck from doing whatever it is that I want in life. So that's really what I, that's who I am. I've been doing this now for over 20 years. I've worked with a diverse population from, from youth to the mentally ill, to the mentally disabled, I mean to the disabled, to working with juveniles, to working with um, male um, inmates, and so, and I've also worked with different people around the world to really empower them and kind of help them align in, on what their purpose is in life and to, to live the best life that they can possibly live. That's, that's me in a nutshell, really. So now I have a question for you, and I'm going to play devil's advocate here because I am empowered that a lot of people with disabilities are not. It's just, I'm empowered just because of the way I was raised to give you guys a nut. So I went to a also expensive private school, which is still also expensive to this day. How I know that is because I teach up the, um, right now I'm on a month long sabbatical. That's another story in itself. Why they put me on my month long sabbatical? I did nothing wrong. It's just scheduling uh, put me on month long sabbatical, but. I am noticing a lot of the disabled population, well, I shouldn't say a lot, some, don't have an empowerment bone in their body. They're depressed. They're dragging me down with them. And I want to know from you, Maria, why um, 
people are are not empowered to do whatever they want to do. I look at it from the perspective of uh, that saying, there's too many followers, enough enough, enough leaders. Um, I always look at it from the perspective, like, and I've said it, is that we are programmed with this limiting belief. We, we follow what society says and that um, we're always trying to look for solution externally instead of looking for within internally. And I've always said when I'm working with people, think about everything that's happening in our life. Uh, and, I, and I always say when we have a headache, where, where do we feel it? We feel it inside. When we're depressed, where do we feel it? We feel it inside. When we're happy, whatever, we feel it inside. But what we do as human beings is we're, is we're looking externally for solutions. We're looking for somebody else to fix us. We're looking for somebody else to justify us. We let circumstance define us instead of us defining the circumstance, which seems to be a rational belief because everything is happening from within, but we're looking for solutions elsewhere instead of being accountable for who we are. And I think that's the part is as people not accepting the positive and negative within us, and the society has a perspective of looking at everything from a negative perspective instead of an empowerment perspective. We're always looking at things from a lack of of perspective instead of, you know, what we have. For example, is I've worked with so many clients and they have a self-defeating kind of mentality of what they don't have or what they're not able to do uh, and instead of looking at it from the perspective of this is what you have, these are my, my blessings, this are what I can do and let's work from there. I've always said the best attitude is when you have an attitude of gratitude. From there, you can work your way up instead of from down. You know, we, we kind of society is kind of has us looking things from things from a perspective of of beating ourselves down. It's kind of almost no different from people having a difficult time accepting compliments. It's because of that that limiting belief that we're lack of or we're not worthy of and we we internalize everything that's coming our way. And so when even when with me when I work with people that's one of the saddest things is this irrational belief that they're not worthy or they don't see anything good about them. And they focus on the victim stance aspect. And so selective hearing, selective vision, selective thoughts, and when you entertain that, everything around you is just so negative. How, how can you see anything light? How can you see anything empowering when you're so focused on the lack of? Now, it's, we listen too much to society. Well, wow. I have a question for you. Yeah. People have selective thoughts. And people have selective hearing, more selective hearing at work. So, because they may not want to hear what their boss is saying in their age clock being, or they, um, they just, um, have had a traffic extravaganza like myself. Myself, I'm actually going through a traffic extravaganza until October. So, um, just to give a real life example of my life right now. Um, but people have selective hearing. So how do we stop having the um, selective hearing and end of it? I, um, I always look at it. One thing I would say is we need to stop personalizing, personalizing things. I know it's difficult. It's not an easy task. To, to do, but to me, I've always said every, everything that comes in our life is a mirror image of unresolved issues within ourselves, and when we start to look at adversities or struggles in our life as it's happening, you know, it's like against us, and we start to look at it as, as okay, these are triggers, these are adversities, what is the message coming to me? 
you know, as I've always said, triggers and everything in our life um, won't mean anything at all, or they, they wouldn't trigger us if it was irrelevant in our life. So usually the triggers, the way I perceive it, or the way I teach it is whatever adversities or whatever struggles, it can be situation, it can be people, visualize that as as, as a mirror. And the, per, the person in the mirror that's looking at you is you. But it's, it's, it's those irrational thoughts, it's those fears, it's whatever it is that's unresolved from within. And you need to really be grounded in that aspect and say, really ask yourself, okay, and not not have fear, but really look at it and say, okay, these are the triggers, these are the adversities or struggles in my life right now. What am I feeling? What does this feel like? And and it really goes to uh, owning up to that feeling because when I look at feelings or emotions, they're not, um, what they are, they're like the GPS system in our life, you know, kind of like the GPS in, in the car, if you make left or right, feelings are neutral, they're not positive or negative, it's what we do with them, they can either free us from our mind or incarcerate us in our mind, when we start to look at emotions and say, these are the emotions, these are the the direction in my path and this, this this emotion is telling me which way to go. I just have to be mindful and know what my intent or where I truly want to be. Because sometimes there's a thing in our life where we say we want the good thing, uh, but our behavior contradicts our thoughts. And if one is contradicting each other, it's not in alignment. So you have to really be truthful with yourself and say, what are, what are these feelings and which, which way am I going to guide them? I can either guide them to imprisonment or I can guide them into freedom and holding, holding that feeling, understanding it, feeling it, accepting it, understanding the message that's behind that. And afterwards, after you accept all that, it's your choice. It will always, always be your choice what, what you want to do with it. You can either let it eat you up or you can release it when you're good and ready and get the message that's clear so you can continue to move forward in life. And so it really goes back to um, accepting that feeling but because what, what we do as human beings is we get these emotions or these triggers or these messages in, in our life and we hold on to it, but then we don't do anything with it. It's almost like stuffing it in our pocket and kind of like that boiling pot analogy. You keep stuffing and stuffing things or not understanding it. It's eventually going to boil up, and it's going to come out in an irrational, impulsive way, which kind of never turns out good. So when you start to look at that, um, I said emotions are energy emotion that moves us to the level that we want to. But we have to understand what that what is it that we want in our life and what are we real and instead of looking at adversities and struggle as bad news, I've always said we have a choice on how we see it. So that's a seeing is that you can say, Okay, here's some bad news again or here's some adversities again. When you think about that if someone tells you Look, I have some bad news for you. We go into a fight or flight response. We're like, here we go again. Here's more negative stuff. Or we can start to look at bad news as, here's some life lessons for you. When you start to look at it as life lessons, or here's some more life lessons, you're like, okay, give it to me. Tell me what it is about so we can finally resolve it and move on. And our intent in life is not to be stuck. Our intent in life is to continue to move. You're not moving in your stagnant. You're not living. And when we really think about fear, fear is not to hold us back. Fear is really there. When fear pops into our head or it's a trigger, what fear really represents is there's potential danger there. 
slow down. It doesn't mean stop, don't move forward. It just says slow down. Our body and our mind wasn't created to stop us or to enable us. Our body and our minds always there continually trying to fight for us, to make us keep moving, to make us live. There's only one fear that we're ever born with, and that's the fear of falling. Every other fear that we have, is we, it was created. Either it was triggered by somebody or somebody told us that, and we entertained it, and it became a very limiting belief within ourselves. So again, the question that you ask is how do you prevent that? It's holding on to the triggers, it's holding on to the adversity, it's understanding those thoughts and how those thoughts are just a part of you and they're not there to hold you back but to empower you so you can move to the direction that you were meant to move to help you find clarity on the purpose that every every message, every trigger is one step closer to whatever it is your purpose is in this life. I hope that answers that question that um, you were asking. Yes, it does. So you uh, you just say when people give you bad news, considering a life lesson, even if the bad news is, uh, which truly happened to me, um, even if bad news is your mother's in the process of die, dying from meningitis. So you consider that a life lesson, even though my mom gave me a lot of life lessons, and she convinced me to go into education, which was a huge life lesson, and now I'm using that in my journalism career because I don't like education. Not to say that I don't like the kids. It's more about the paycheck and the admin. It's more about the paycheck than the admin. All talk and walk all day about how teachers should get paid more than we do, and public school and private school and all across the country, and in the um, in other countries too, they get low paychecks. And so, I'll just say this: use bad news if you can as a life lesson even if it's about someone dying and from what I from what I learned is having someone die, having someone as a significant loss makes you stronger as a human being. My God. It just makes you stronger. So Maria what you that was that I'm sorry. Say that again? No, I said it is. I mean, someone dying and stuff like that, that's one of the hardest, you know, someone that we love or whatever is dying. You know, we can put ourselves in that victim stance because one of the reasons with that is is that we're fix, human beings are fixer by nature. You know, we don't like to be in limbo. We don't like to be off balance. And when we can't fix things in our life, we kind of feel stuck. And that's kind of what's the thing with, with death is, is we're just human. And fixer by nature and one thing that we think that we can't fix. But we're not there to fix other people. We're, we're there, you know, especially in death, as just there as, as a shoulder, as a support. But when we're losing someone, we kind of personalize it and we get angry. A lot of people get angry and say, why am I losing this person? And it's not fair. It's not that. And so with any situation, is we need to really stop personalizing it and viewing it as a victim stance aspect. Again, it really goes back to that whole lesson of, yes, this sucks. I don't like it. But overall, what is it about? And one thing about someone dying is we focus on that one day or that one situation when they're passing instead of the whole lifetime of memories with them, the whole lifetime of journey with them. But we, we learn to focus on that just one day, you know. Yeah, well, um, you know. I was incredibly loved, and thank goodness I have a stepmom 
She's not my stepmom officially yet, but I call her my stepmom anyway because she lives with me. And um, so I am lucky enough that I was loved enough in my life to know that these two women love me and they would do anything for me. And my mom, my biological mom, went to the end of the earth for me. And so I was, and I still do, I was focusing on the good memories, and I still focus on the good memories. So, Maria, what is your favorite book? And it doesn't have to be a business book related. It just has to be a book that you go back to time and time again. Um, my favorite book is Tuesday with Maury. And it's kind of like what I said at the beginning. It's it's being grateful. It's being it's it's having gratitude in everything. Yeah. And to me, the book Tuesday is with Maury. And, and it's funny that we talked about death and everything. But you know, that's the book itself, Tuesday with Maury, talks about the blessings in life as as he struggles with Bulgaria and his life goes the opposite. And he every day. Something that, that disease itself takes something away from you. Today may be your vision, tomorrow may be your hearing. So you appreciate today, you appreciate this, this moment, you appreciate this second, and you do what you can at this moment instead of delaying it and delaying it, instead of thinking that we have forever, so let me procrastinate. So I, I really love that book. It really reminds me of staying in gratitude with everything and not taking anything for granted. You know, not focusing in the past, not focusing on the future, but being present, being right here, right now, and being attentive to everything that there is and really just seeing the blessings in that. So that, that's my favorite book that I, I will always go back to because it reminds you of the tiny little things that we forget to appreciate because how busy life gets or how hectic life gets, you know. So to me, that's my go-to book. That's your go-to book, and it's funny. I, um, I think I read that book on audio tape uh, oh. in a long time ago. And if you had to be educated by anyone, inside or outside, you feel dead or alive, who would it be and why? What was that? I'm sorry again. If you had to be educated by anyone, inside or outside your field, who would it be and why? Um, Gandhi. <laughs> and and why? Because especially now, how um how crazy our world is. It's, it's different from being a kid and being now, and how everybody's life just seems impulsive. Even how people are trying to resolve problems, or even with kids now, they just seem so so violent, and everything is like through guns, through violence, through impulsiveness, and and with the, I, I appreciate the social media and how the internet and every technology is advancing, but there's a saying that um, I love, and it says, this is the easiest, most luckiest generation out of any other generation in the we've had that we are the laziest and the most ungrateful generation and it goes back to that and and what I what I loved about Gandhi is that um he, he let go of the materialistic stuff, he let go of all that stuff and tried to find an altruistic way to resolve things. And it's again it goes back to what I said, it's looking from within instead of the external things, looking at the positive things instead of negative things and trying to find solution to rectify whatever he had to fight for. It wasn't through violence, it wasn't through anything. That it was focusing on him to be able to change something. I've always said when you stop victimizing yourself, you learn to stop victimizing others. This it's more powerful to reach out to people by 
by our action, by our words, than it is by the mighty fist or by the gun or whatever it is. So anybody who is the Gandhi, I love to to be more in that altruistic state. I think it's one of the things that we don't have a lot in our society is a lot more of the altruistic mentality or people in our life. Oh, that, that, that would be the person for me. And Maria, where can people find you and where can people get a hold of you? Um, I have... I have my my business. It's, it's a spiritual essence, and um, I also have a Facebook blog that I I have, and it's also called Spiritual Essence. And what it is is daily motivation and guidance um, from the soul. And I blog there almost every day. Either I'm writing something or I'm putting a video about life adversities or struggles because I think it's one of those things that we don't do much in society anymore is self-reflect, to, to self-reflect, to ponder, and, and really ask ourselves those questions. So that's what my blog is on Spiritual Essence. It's on Facebook to really, I ask a lot of deep questions to help people. Our, our spiritual essence that this is um, services that I provide. It's coaching, it's advising, um, you know, to really help people. So those are two places that you can they can reach me at. So people can contact you through your website. Yes. It's through Facebook and all that. And Maria. Do you have a couple questions for me? And then I'm going to ask you another question after you ask me a couple questions that I just thought of. Okay. I I love, uh, and you said it, I I love your drive. I love your your motivation, you know. And um, I don't see a lot of people with that passion. Where do you get this, this passion that you have? Where do you get this, this essence of just having this drive and to advocate for what you believe? A lot of people are so afraid to move. A lot of people are so afraid to take a chance. Like you like this fire and you, you just have this drive. And I, I just totally love this passion that you have. Now, well, if you want to be a journalist, you have to do the work. And excuse my French, everyone, but if you want to be a journalist, you have to get off your lazy ass and do the work. People say, oh, I want to write a book. Oh, I want to start a podcast. But yes, they don't do anything. And I'm actually being trained by a um, trained right now, professionally trained as we speak, as part of my journalism degree by a man called Maddie Stout, who runs iHeart Radio in San Francisco and left his morning radio career to start iHeart Radio. iHeart Radio is one of the biggest um, podcasting aggregator apps in the world, and my podcast is on iHunt Radio, and what he's trying to teach his students is all about the radio and communication build and the podcasting build, but I think what people have got to do is they have got to get off their lazy asses if they want to write a book and want to do um, half the stuff I'm doing, half the stuff you're doing, Maria, because a lot of people think I want to write a book. Well, if you think that one more time, you're going to be sitting there for the next year thinking I'm going to write about a book, and now I'm off my sofa. Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not just saying it, it's actually every day stepping up, putting the effort, putting the behavior. Yes, it's, a, it's not just saying it, it's every day stepping up and doing it. Yeah. 
And do you ever a time when you do? And I think that's what's difficult for a lot of people. You know, they can say it, they can see the vision, uh, but the, that first step. That's the first step is what people struggle with is taking that first step. So when, when you start to have those anxiety or fear, what are your coping skills to to continue taking those steps? Because we all have those, you know, limiting beliefs. I or, have a uh, fear. Of, I have a personal fear going through my life right now as we speak. I am going through a huge transition, which I mentioned in I Come A Win. I mentioned in the beginning of it in I Come A Win. I didn't know um, it was going to be part of my life many, many years later. I just thought I would mention it in I Come A Win, and that would be it. But, um, yeah, I'm expecting a call with will change my life forever. And those of you who listened to last week's podcast know what it is. And know I'm going to be taking at least one day off from it. I haven't gotten a call yet. I've um, been expecting this call. But how I'm going to deal with it is to grace and style and meet it, meet what I'm dealing with head on and deal with it with grace and style and have the team support about me that I need. That's that's well said, you know, and I think that's really what it is. And that's how I'm dealing with this huge, scary, good it's going to be a good thing, but right now it's a little bit scary because I don't know how it's going to pan out. I, yeah, I didn't know this was going to be happening to me in my studies. I knew about, I knew about this thing when I was 17 years old, and I, like most 17 um, year olds, didn't think about money and didn't think about um, how this was going to impact my life. I mentioned in I Come A Win that my family found a caterpillar practice and so now that um, something is coming in my life that's even bigger and better, I am scared half to death as to what I'm going to do with it, but I'm going to be it with grace and style and be it head on, like I always do. And I think that's the only thing. It's really one of the scariest things is just surrender to the process and really realize that um, if you keep stepping up and stepping up, even though you may not understand what's going on right now or there's the fear, you just keep stepping up. And it's going to, if you keep stepping up, then it's going to align you to to your purpose. You know, whatever it is that you believe in, it, if you, as long as you keep moving, you're going to be rewarded. Be it in any way, mentally, physically, emotionally, financially, you know, you will be rewarded when you continue to step up to your power. You continue to to keep moving. Yeah. And I believe it. And that's how I'm going to deal with this thing in the either this week or the week after the next as soon as I receive the phone call or as soon as my dad does. You let me know what's going on. Of course, my dad and I are in communication, and so were my um, biological mom and I, and so all my stepmom and I. I mean, my stepmom thinks so logically. We had a wonderful conversation last night. I told her something that was going on, and she took a logical, logical approach, which I did not take when this whole situation was going on, and um, part of it was going on, and she goes, 
this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And I literally said, you think logically. I think five by the seat of my pants. <laughs> I think five by the seat of my pants. I also greet deal with grace and style. Now, Maria, you said uh, something that piques my interest. You said millennials are lazy. Now, Glenn, I'm a 90s kid. I was... Um, Born in 87, June 22nd of 87, so I'm a millennial. So that being said, why do you think millennials are lazy? Because I have heard that from several people now, and I just want to get your opinion on it. The, the reason I said um, um, the, the generation, yeah, this, this, this generation, is because we stop looking at, like I said, it, it's a lack of gratitude for what it is. It, it's, a, it's a world that we live in now that seems to be based on instant gratification. It's press this button, do this, stuff that. It's, it's our, our, the world that we live in now is how to make things easy. A lot of people are afraid of work, afraid of hard work, afraid of struggle. And we, we, so many of us are looking for this instant gratification for everything. And, like, it's just supposed to come to us. And we're not supposed to put any work. We're not supposed to put any effort. And that's kind of why I, I, I made that, that, that statement that this is a generation that takes everything for granted, that it's a generation that um, we don't appreciate what we have, but it's a generation where everything does come easy. Think of back 500, 600 years ago, you know, we don't, we don't have all the technology that we have now. And instead of appreciating it to help enhance it, we, we rely everything on technology and everything and there's this crazy irrational belief that life has to be easy all the time. And if there's some adversity or struggles or hardship, people don't want to do anything about it. They fall straight to the victim stands. It goes back to that limiting belief. Everything in our life is not supposed to be easy. The adversities in our life are meant to be there. Everything in our life that comes our way is supposed to enhance us. But we don't start to see things in our life as something that enhances us. We just see it as the solution to, to our problem, period. You know, it's, it's us that needs to appreciate things. It's us that needs to keep moving forward. And everything else in life is like the cherry, up, cherry on top of the sundae, the, the frosting on the cake. It just makes us better. But we're, it's our responsibility to keep moving forward. It's our responsibility to, to go face on with adversity instead of having everything come to us. And that's where it goes back to the, the beginning, why so many are so lost, why so many are depressed, are struggling, and why I think so many, there's so much violence in the world is because people have this become defeated, become depressed, because they're expecting answers or solution or this feel-good moment just to come to them instead of them moving forward to, to seek those truths, yeah. the answer to seek, seek resolution. That's why. Yeah, well, I was just curious why, I was just curious why you said that, because I don't believe millennials are um, a lazy. I believe that especially disabled millennials, give them a job, they do it to the 10th degree. Give them, I have a friend who um, campaign, who campaigned for coming Colorado governor over the weekend. And she of course loves campaigning. And she did her job to the 10th degree to the point of she was sending me text message text messages saying, Will you support me? And I said, Yes I will just because it's you and yes, I support the government and I support what well not right now, I don't support what's completely going on in the government, but 
in general, I support what's going on in the government. So I have to back your attitude that millennials are lazy. I don't believe it. I do agree with you that they are the um, push-button generation, and they don't use cell phones like they should, and I agree with you there's too much gun violence, but I also do not believe that millennials are the latest generation. All right. Just saying, just yeah. saying, and I'll I mean, probably... Like, like, like I said, and, everything's not carved in stone, and everything's carved in stone. It, it doesn't categorize everybody in one cluster. Yeah, yeah I know. I know. Yeah. But um, but throwing that out on a um, nationally listened to podcast, you're going to get um, you're going to get some feedback of course, from of that comment, and so that's why I want to back that up. And so um, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story, and I hope to do it again soon. And you guys, I hope you enjoy listening to Maria's story of empowerment and how to get all of us empowered. And um, I just wish more millennials would listen to this um, podcast because I think they also need to get themselves empowered. I truly believe that. And I just hope you enjoyed the conversation, and of course, we'll have all Mobius information in the show notes. You guys know Danielle is good at um, putting out show notes, and my podcast comes out on Tuesdays now, not Tuesdays and Thursdays, and a huge thank you goes out to Emily of the podcast Productions, Emily Pokoff and also the story behind, which also can be found in Spotify. If you want to go down a rabbit hole with the story behind, please do. And, yeah, that's all I'm saying. And about that, and she's the one that's helping me edit this podcast, even though I'm the one doing the majority of the editing, but she is putting the finishing touches on them, like the intro and outro. And so a huge thank you goes out to her, and a huge thank you goes out to Maria for coming on and sharing her story. And I'll see you guys later with another fantastic interview. Thanks to you guys. Bye.